Abdi Pasha. September 2nd, 1686, in Buda, Hungary. The veteran warrior and commander Abdi Pasha is defending the Buda castle with only a couple thousand Ottoman soldiers. Their enemy, the Holy League, led by Charles V, Duke of Lorraine. Charles has already demanded Abdi's surrender. After a long and successful career, will the great Pasha from Pichin submit, or will he keep his besser or oath to defend the castle until his death? According to the well-known Ottoman traveler and contemporary Evliya Celebi, Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha was born in the early 1600s in Pechin, Albania, to a family originating from an obscure village in the Elbasan district by the name of Kopani or Sikul. More than an hour on horseback from the city of Pechin, Like many Albanians, Abdi entered the Janissary court at a young age, working his way up from a common Janissary to Kol Kuthuda, a deputy to the Janissary Aga. Abdi's true story, however, did not begin until the year 1669, when he was in his fifties. By this time, Abdi had become something of an anomaly by rising from a common Janissary to the Aga of the Janissary. This was highly uncommon, due to previous revolts. Agas of the Janissaries were not ordinarily chosen from among the Janissary ranks. An unorthodox rise indeed. But then again, there was nothing common about Abdi. Abdi finds himself sailing towards the siege of Kandia in full swing at what is now modern-day Heraklion on the island of Crete. The island's strategic location, together with the wealth which passed through it, thanks to a lucrative salt trade, made it a desirable prize for any empire. In 1644, an Ottoman convoy returning from its pilgrimage to Mecca was attacked by the Knights of Malta. The boat was seized, but those on board were not just average citizens. They were members of the Sultan's harem. This embarrassment triggered a siege. The Ottomans expected a quick takeover, however. The siege became a long back and forth struggle where each side sought to wear the other down. Now, in 1669, with the siege in its 21st year, the Janissary Aga Abdi Pasha joins Koprulu Fazil Ahmed Pasha of the famous Albanian dynasty, the Koprulus. They are determined to finally resolve this embarrassment. Taking advantage of Kandia's weakened infrastructure, the Ottomans end their longest siege in history by storming the island in a furious display of trench warfare. Ending the longest siege in Ottoman history, Evliya Celebi was present for the siege and mentions that without the combined efforts of Koprulu Fazil Ahmed and Abdi Pasha, the city would never have been fully conquered. He tells a fascinating story from the negotiation room, where Abdi Pasha took it upon himself to control its discussion. 
Abdi Pasha, upon hearing the Venetians wanted to retain land in Crete, burst out, You be damned! He argues Selim II hadn't allowed it, and neither should they. The Christian population leave Candia unharmed. And a prisoner swap occurs. The Ottomans allow the Venetians to keep Grambusa, Suda, and Spinalonga, a very generous deal. Before their meeting concludes, Abdi Pasha has the Venetians take an oath that they will not harm any Muslim pilgrims traveling in the Mediterranean. The Sultan's honor had finally been avenged. Evliya Celebi mentions that Abdi Pasha commissioned a beautiful complex comprising of a mosque, a school, a fountain, and a bazaar built in Candia. In 1672, Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha participates in the Polish expedition as a Janissary Aga alongside Sultan Mehmed IV. After the castle of Kamyanitz, located in modern-day Ukraine, is conquered, Abdi receives the rank of Vizier and two valuable horses from the Sultan himself. By 1674, he has become governor of the Baghdad Eilat. Threatened by the Ottomans' hereditary enemy, the heretical Safavids, Abdi successfully commands Baghdad for almost two years before transferring to Egypt on May 11, 1676. The Nile country is dealing with social unrest due to the poor leadership of Abdurrahman Pasha's predecessor, Ahmed Pasha. Abdi quickly settles the unrest and eliminates those revolting by making an example of a powerful and high-ranking deputy of the Azeb troops by having him killed, crushing any traces of rebellion in the process. In 1681, Abdi is appointed governor of Bosnia. While in Bosnia, locals choose to insult the veteran Pasha, shouting, Devre Chikma, or the governor should not wander around. By doing so, they accuse him of not paying attention to his duties. The Pasha replies, I have the Sultan's order for this duty. A quarrel breaks out and many are killed. Once again, Abdi is forced to put down a revolt. In 1682, at the Podolia Island, the same castle of Kamyanitz that Abdi helped conquer ten years earlier, is now under attack. Only now, Abdi is governor and commander of the castle. The Poles want the castle back and storm the walls for a month. But Abdi and his men beat them back, holding on to the castle. 1684, Buda. The city of Buda had originally been conquered by Suleiman the Magnificent and his troops in 1541. Though many attempts had been made to take it back, they had all failed. Ottoman rule had thus continued, uninterrupted in the city for almost 150 years. The Venetian knight Francesco Grimani wrote, Buda is a magnificent city in a pleasant location. Mountains rise above it, and plains spread to the horizon on the pest side, and its soil is fertile. The fortification of Buda Castle consisted of a wall divided by large and small roundels and a dry ditch which stretched along its length. The northern castle facade had reinforced stone walls. Two corridors built from parallel walls with two defense roundels built on the shore secured the supply of the castle's drinking water with three main entry gates the Ferhirvar, the Vienna, and the Visivarosh. Inside the walls, Buda was a cultural center 
with a population no more than 10,000. Jewish and Gypsy immigrants were protected. Armenians, along with other Europeans, made it their home. Several hundred Hungarian Christians lived comfortably in the city throughout the 17th century. While many churches had been converted into mosques, few churches did remain. The various Christian denominations, including Orthodox Christians and Lutherans, could be found sharing those churches for prayer. Although with restrictions, these conditions indicate that Buddha had a thriving socially and religiously diverse society. In May of 1684, Imperial forces 40,000 strong, led by the Duke of Lorraine, are attempting to take the city. The Ottomans, led by Grand Vizier Kara Ibrahim Pasha and Abdi Pasha, have around 7,000 men in the castle and a relief force of around 17,000. Ibrahim and Abdi Pasha continually baffle the Imperial forces over and over drawing the enemy in and cutting them down. The Imperial forces do make some gains. When their auxiliary forces arrive, however, a relief force of 17,000 Ottomans appears to meet them. Although the Imperial forces initially do well against the Ottoman relief force. Poor decision-making and strategic shortfalls lead the forces of the Duke of Lorraine nowhere. The Duke and his men can't achieve much more as winter approaches. After 109 days, the siege ends in a withdrawal for the Imperial Army and a victory for the Ottomans. It's an embarrassing moment for the Duke of Lorraine. Imperial forces lose somewhere between 20 and 30,000 men from battles and disease. The next time the Duke attacks, he will know better. Grand Vizier Kara Ibrahim Pasha is the recognized hero of the siege. But the wise Albanian from Pichin adds another stripe of honor to his career as well. Then, in 1686, Abdi is commander of the Buddha Castle with less than 10,000 men by his side. On his way for another round is Charles V, Duke of Lorraine. He is accompanied by soldiers of the Holy League totaling somewhere between 90 and 100,000 men. Abdi's course of action is to wear down and frustrate the enemy, utilize the high ground and bombard his enemies with cannon fire. If he can, lure them in close enough to set off mines, then counterattack with soldiers in a ground battle. In early July, the Imperial forces set up mines, hoping for a breach through which they can send infantry to attack the walls. Seeing this, Abdi sets off his own mines and lets his cannons roar. The blasts cause one of the walls of the castle to buckle. Seeing this weakness, the Imperial forces attack, but a Turkish rifle bullet strikes the leader of their middle assault column, sowing confusion among their ranks. The Imperial munitions catch fire, scorching many of their faces, the combined heat of the burning goatskin bags and wicks filled with gunpowder. When Charles V orders a retreat, 
the Ottomans detonate two additional mines to send them off. Two hundred Janissaries break out of the castle to pursue the retreating army. Shocked by the Ottoman success, Venetian knight Grimani wrote in his report on July 16th, If Buddha does not fall, I fear that peace would be inevitable. Luck had not abandoned the Imperial army. In later assault, the Spanish engineer Don Gonzalez launches firebombs into the castle. He is lucky enough to hit the Turkish gunpowder depot, which explodes immediately and with tremendous thunder. A chunk of castle wall is destroyed, killing 500 of Abdi's men. Dietz, a field surgeon from Brandenburg, reports. The whole horizon went black. Earth, stone, and human brain fell. I couldn't think of anything else but the end of the world. I escaped under the beams with the others. None of us saw anything for half an hour because of all the dust, stones, and steam. Another report states that a traitor blew up the gunpowder room. Regardless, with his munitions destroyed and the wall damaged, Abdi must reinforce the wall as a furious battle ensues. The Turks throw firebombs of their own, an eyewitness recounts. The battle continued day and night for the city and the army of the Emperor. Glory to the army. Threw the bombs continuously, and the cannon shot pitch and sulfur into the city. Houses collapsed, walls fell. He said again last night, I wish it was morning, and in the morning, I wish it was night. Twelve times they stormed the castle and killed everyone standing on the walls. The Turks gathered all their strength and made them flee. With these events unfolding, the Europeans felt they had the upper hand. Even the Mufti of Buddha tells Abdi that he should give up. The Duke sends a letter to Abdi demanding he surrender, but Abdi responds confidently. We have received your letter and understood its content. As soon as you left your home, we knew that you intended to take this castle. So we are working day and night with all our might for the sake of our faith, but we cannot hand over the castle. You told me you wanted to storm the castle. You have tried once or twice, and God punished you. If you still intend to attack, then we request and hope that the Almighty punish you with all his strength and power, as you have become arrogant, and God is the enemy and punisher of arrogance. What the Duke and his allies cannot understand is that Abdi Pasha gave an oath. In Albanian, this was his Besa, an ancient code of honor amongst his people. He promised to protect the castle and its citizens until his death. Dying meant nothing. Breaking his Besa was far worse. Understanding the consequences of losing the castle, the local population hasn't stayed idle. Every able-bodied man, woman, and child has chipped in to help. Some are responsible for firefighting, others for carrying war tools. The roofs of the city's houses are torn down, their wood and stones transported behind the castle walls. Abdi has ordered all the cisterns filled with water and begun construction on another. The adjutant general of the Duke of Lorraine assist Abdurrahman's leadership. Indeed, all Turkish defense measures were carried out in such an exemplary manner that there was no shortage during the siege. The Duke sends a second letter. In his second and final reply, Abdi, in spite of all he is dealing with, lightens the mood by suggesting they negotiate for another castle rather than Buddha. He goes on to write. Above all, we send our warmest greetings. We have received the letters and have learned that you wish to surrender the castle again. The handover of the castle is in God's almighty power and not in our hands. 
You have notified us of your mercy, and you do not desire bloodshed. Therefore, make an effort to reach an agreement that is beneficial to both parties, to free the subjects from total conquest and suffering. We will do our utmost to reach an agreement which is good for both parties. May the servants of God Almighty stop the fires of this war as soon as possible. Amin. Abdurrahman, Commander of Buddha. Rumors spread, and on July 31st, a Serbian flees, crossing over to the Imperial Army telling them no more than a thousand soldiers would continue to fight, that the Janissaries rebelled and wished to surrender Buta's castle, but that Abdi refused to comply with their demands. This was not true. It seems that Abdi's enemies wanted to expedite his demise. The old Pasha still had plenty of fight in him, and his soldiers were loyal. On August 3rd, the Hungarian Guard attempts a major assault on the castle. It's poorly devised. Some get caught in ditches, others in the trenches. But with their command of the high ground, Abdi's troops shoot and it's target practice. To their credit, the soldiers make three attempts to charge, but all fail. High-ranking officers are among the casualties. Cornaro. An ambassador from Venice remarked on this assault that the Turks had once again provided their usual proof of perseverance and fearlessness. There is news that the Bosnian Grand Vizier, Sari Suleiman Pasha, is somewhere nearby with a relief force between 30 and 40,000 strong. Abdi Pasha becomes much more optimistic throughout the rest of August. The Turks and Bavarians have a few skirmishes, but the Turks have been cut down more than once and are running low on men. Finally, the Grand Vizier arrives and for the moment does nothing. Abdi Pasha is confused. While theories abound, there is no satisfactory answer for Sadi Suleiman Pasha's inaction. The Grand Vizier retreats by the end of August, abandoning Abdi Pasha, who has already held out for more than two months. Frescott, the court priest of Charles of Lorraine, judges the behavior of the Grand Vizier. The cowardly fold contemptible vizier instead of making any effort to prevent the consequences by attacking the army or the lines looked in a foolish and hulking state and when the christian army rushed began the most heinous run during the night if we didn't know better it would almost seem as if abdi's enemies were rooting for him without his reinforcements. Abdi Pasha now has two choices, surrender or fight to the death. As August ends, Abdi and his 2,000 soldiers would not be able to resist much longer. Taking advantage of their weakness, the Holy League captures the earthen tower in the east of the castle and the Frenji tower in the west, finally managing to enter the fortress between noon and afternoon on the 78th day of the siege. On September 2nd, 1686, Abdi Pasha and his soldiers meet the enemy at the castle's Vienna gate.
The great Pasha is not one to break his word. He attacks together with his troops and dies with a great many of them on the front lines. Some of his soldiers survive, but they will probably wish they had died in the battle in the coming days. Although slavery and defeat was expected, War crimes were not. For the people of Buddha, those not enslaved were massacred. Men, women, and children. The surgeon Dietz writes, Maternal love could not protect the children who were all dead. I saw women lying dead, holding a gun or a sword in their hands. Wild animals are gentler with each other than humans. It was said that the Sultan wept in Istanbul, and Ottoman citizens were furious with their government. Although the cowardly Grand Vizier Sari Suleiman deserved immediate execution, he was only banished for a short time. Only a year later, however, in 1687, he would be executed after a Janissary revolt because of his weak leadership. Is it strange to imagine these Janissaries might still have had a soft spot for their former Aga Abdi? A question for the viewer. If the Grand Vizier had chosen to fight rather than flee, do you think Abdi Pasha could have pulled off another victory? Buddha was burned to the ground. Buddha would eventually rise again, however, to become a beautiful city once more. Abdi Pasha's left a legacy so great that he is remembered today with honor. In the early 1900s, a monument in the style of an Ottoman tombstone was erected in Hungary and dedicated to the great Pasha, commissioned not by the request of the Turkish government, but by the Hungarians. It reads, The last governor of the 145-year-long occupation of Buddha, Abdurrahman Abdi Pasha the Albanian, fell in this area on September 2nd, 1686, when he was 70 years old. He was a heroic enemy. May he rest in peace. Also named in honor of Abdi is the Pasaret, or the Pasha's Meadows a neighborhood in Budapest. Abdi Pasha was known as a free thinker with an interest in Islamic mysticism. As governor of Baghdad, he restored the tombstone of well-known 9th century mystic Maruf al-Kari. As governor of Egypt, he commissioned historian Mahmud bin Abdullah to write a chronicle titled The History of Egypt. As mentioned, he endowed Candia with a beautiful complex. He also enriched his hometown of Pichin in Albania with a mosque, water fountains, and a stone bridge, along with the infrastructure necessary to secure fresh water. Historian and fellow contemporary Siladar Findikli Mehmed Aga described Abdi Pasha as the owner of the spear, reckless, brave, courageous, humble, and very generous. Abdi Pasha ruled with a firm but fair hand. He protected the weak and conquered territory. He gave an oath to defend Buddha until his death and honored his word until his dying breath. His unbelievable final stand in his old age was against 90,000 men in a glorious showdown. Through the blood he spilt, he made his legacy and courage known throughout the world. Labdi, 
to the Pasha from Pichin, Abdi Pasha. Thank you for watching Abdi Pasha's story. Although mentioned on his memorial as 70 years old, Ottoman historians and contemporaries say Abdi Pasha was at least or over 80 years of age at the time of his death. Letters dated from December 1684. From a journal in the Top Kapi Palace Museum Library, declare Abdi Pasha to be one of the most experienced veterans in the empire. With the letters, Abdi was gifted with sable fur, a robe of honor, and a sword. Aside from the monument in Hungary, the closest we can get to Abdi Pasha is the mosque he had built in Pechen. As mighty as the man who had it built, it still stands proudly despite heavy damage by a fire in the 1830s. Eventually restored with the addition of the clock tower by descendants of Abdi Pasha, namely Shafir Sadik Pasha. More recently, the dome and minaret were repaired after the communist dictatorship decided to damage them. It's interesting to note that in its day, thanks to Abdi Pasha, Pechin was a center for the arts. Finally, we wholeheartedly thank those responsible for erecting and maintaining the monument to Abdi Pasha. As we know, war is brutal, but to show respect to your enemy was always considered a coveted trait. We deeply appreciate the respect you've given to our ancestor. We encourage Albanians to visit the site if they are in Hungary.